Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our special interest group uh, meeting today. Um, today, we got, I'm going to, I, a while back, I was talking about using some of the more traditional tools. And um, today, we're going to explore that a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, Jim Strawn, who is uh, one of our very active members here, gave me a couple of chunks of black acacia. And um, it immediately threw me back to an event a few years ago where I tried to make a stool and it didn't all work out too well. Um, this was uh, contrary to what some people may think. I'm just a bungling amateur and it's been not that many years since I started doing woodworking. So I'm just learning all the time. And a few years ago, I made a I wanted to make a, a, a stool from a, from a fine woodworking article in uh, the October 2016. I needed a little light relief at that time. Um, but uh, in the October, October of 2016, a German gentleman called Fabian Fischer um, published an article with uh, the plans for a nice little stool that I thought would go very nicely in my bench and also an article about uh, Travishes, which is the tool that I'm going to focus on today. Um, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But before that, I want to show you a few photographs. All right, so this is the stool I made. It was made with some black acacia. And, um, and uh, it was on the the uh, legs had a couple of issues. One is they were made of shimmel ash, which is not the same ash as we buy in the wood stores. And as you can see, it's also got a few knots, which at the time I kind of liked, you know, because I wanted character in the wood and it was locally grown wood and locally harvested. And uh, I made this and, and it was, uh, there were some big mistakes in it, but it worked fine. And uh, I used it in my shop for a few weeks. And uh, then one evening I sat down to take a break, and I heard this ominous dry cracking sound, and it was the up up at the uh, at the point where the uh, the legs joined to the seat. One of the legs had cracked, and uh, it was basically scrap wood at that point. So I kept the seat and chopped off the the uh, the legs, and eventually put the seat on top on a uh, um, on on another. Uh, seat that's just a basic uh, shop chair with, 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 you know, and it used to have a padded seat and now it has the wooden seat. So it looks like not very good, but it, it works. So about, I've always wanted to repeat this experience and actually make a stool that works. So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jim Strong gave me a couple of pieces, oops, a couple of, pieces of nice pieces of black acacia. And they were just about the right size to make a to make a, um, a seat, such as uh, I've, I've got on the table today. So I took these home, and on Monday I started working with them and started planing them off and uh, doing a little uh, cross-grain planing there. And uh, it, it, black acacia is a beautiful wood. When you plane it, it just has this lovely gloss, but it does have some very challenging features. It, it's got it's um, got interlocking grain much in the way that color does. So, so um, it's, somebody's just trying to come in with a bunch of noise. But anyway, um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, cha challenging to plane out. So I was just doing a rough plane. Um, and then I glued the two together. And, uh, and then uh, I have a template for the, for the shape of the seat, drew out the template, the shape of the temp of the seat and then bam sawed it out. This is another angle of, of just starting to cut it out with the band saw. And by the end of it, I ended up with this interesting circular hole in a piece of wood and my seat. Um, but uh, I'm gonna be needing that wood as I will show you shortly. So I think that's the end of the photograph. So I came into the shop on Thursday and one of the things that, one of the features of this of this uh, seat is that all the legs go, have at least two angles. So, they, so they're compound angles. They, the back legs are angled at 
12 degrees outwards and I'm sorry, six degrees outwards and 12 degrees backwards. The front legs here are a little wider apart and they're angled at eight and 15, I think, or the other way around anyway, which leads to my point. I came in here the other day and what I normally do is I use a combination of two um, ramps that are made up. This one's made up for six degrees. I've got another one over there for 12 and you carefully line them up and and you know where your hole is going to be and you drill through from the bottom using those two angles. Well, I thought I'd save myself some trouble the other day and came into the shop and decided to cut those angles. Yes, oh, yes, so that's great. So normally we would, I just got past this. I would, I, I would have the combination of the two angles there, lay that on a flat surface and then, um, and, and then drill through it with, and I drilled through these, this with a, uh, with a, thank you, um, frosting a bit. So uh, you can, you, if you had it, if you had a um, Brad point that bit that big, that would be a very good thing to do it with. Anyway, so I brought it, I came into the shop the other day, cut up the angles and so on. Did beautiful, beautiful holes, lovely clean, nice holes and took it home and what I did was I have a, a few sample legs here and I just put the legs in and I realized very rapidly that my legs were coming out. So these were coming out at 15 degrees instead of six degrees and, um, and the same with the front. So it was gonna be a, a ridiculous looking stool. So, what I did was, what I'm going to do is I, 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 I and have done is I first I plugged it with some poplar, and I'm going to cut. I'm going to uh, going to bring this seat down to somewhat close to where I want to be today. And um, once it's all cut out, and I know exactly where it's going to be, I'm going to use those scraps to make little inserts, so that hopefully it'll be barely noticeable the, the problem, because of course. The problem with this is that on the top here, you can see I've got some nice pieces of poplar there. So a lot of that's going to taken out, get taken out. So once it's back to where it should be, I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, then put a little inlay in there. But that that's an, that'll be another story, and I'll be using the, the rest of this. So. The, uh, the seat is what I want to focus on today. This seat is, as, you, as I told you, made out of black acacia. It's now got the holes drilled in the right way. So actually I can put four legs in here and it's a stool all by itself, um, but only short legs. I want a longer leg. This, by the way, is the original Schimmel Ash. And this was a spare one that I made. And back, back in those days, I didn't have much in the way of tools, so I hand shaped this. Um, but uh, it's lovely stuff. It looks like ash. It's really nice to work with, but don't expect a lot of strength out of it. So I'm actually going to go with white oak this time, because I happen to have some white oak. I was going to go with red oak, but I've got some white oak. So in, in, uh, probably in the next one, um, I'll show you how we work the legs part of it. Um, but the seat, one of the, one of the features of that article was the, the traditional tool that's used to, um, to shape the seat. I don't know if any of you have been to Palomar College and taken the seat making or the chair making classes there, but the, you know, say the Maloof chair class, which is an amazing chair, but the way you hollow out the seat is, is by using, um, power tools, basically a, a, a sort of a very fancy grinder or um, that, uh, that hollows out your, your seat here. And um, that's all well and good, but I found using tools like that, it's easy to make a mistake because all you have to do is dig in and, 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 and start cutting where you don't want to cut. Um, and it's noisy, very, very dusty, and, uh, and not, not necessary to do. Did somebody ask a question there? I thought I heard someone speaking. Um, so, okay, so we've got this seat. I've worked a little bit on it, and I'll, I'll now introduce you to the tool that we're going to use. 
This is a Travis shot. It's basically a curved blade, and a little later on I'll show you how I sharpen it. It's a curved blade on the bottom. It's not flat, it's actually hollow ground, but I can establish flatness. And then on the and then there's a, a bevel blade down in here, and it's adjustable up and down. In order to work really well, what one wants to do is, I don't know if you can, it shows up a little better against the white light, I think. I want my blade to be just sticking up over the edge here. Not much more. I don't want the edges to be sticking up because they're going to leave ridges. And I don't want to be trying to take the full width of the cut there because it's a, it's a, it's a deep cut and it's a lot of work. And it's only a small little tool. It works much better being super sharp and uh, just working away at it. So um, this seat, let's go to the close-up now. Right, nice, nice picture. So I've uh, I've worked the one side a little bit. Now I'm ready to work the other side, and I'm going to use a combination of a clamp. They hold fast. I find the hold fast is really helpful because it's it's easy to undo and uh, and to move the the piece around. And if necessary, uh, I I can also use um use uh, dog in here but I'm gonna whack this down and note that I put a little uh, wooden call there because even though I'm gonna be cutting this away you can see I've already got marks here even though I'm gonna be cutting this away um, I uh, I want to spare that you know just get myself in the habit of not putting metal on wood so I've marked out a few of the critical shapes on the side and on here and this is what I'm trying to imitate basically this is that original seat and it still knocks around in my shop and I sit on it and it's very very comfortable and you can just see even beat up it's just beautiful beautiful wood um, but this is what I want to achieve but on this occasion I want to make it a little thicker I just want to make it a little beefier um, and what I'll, I'll compensate for the look of that by putting a, a bigger bevel on the underside. So what I'm going to work on today is just up the top here. And now black acacia, I mentioned the, the grain tends to change very easily. Um, normally when you're gluing something like this together and then you're going to be hand working it, you really want to ensure that your grain is all going the right way because of the aesthetics of this particular one and the fact that the grain changes unpredictably within this this wood, um, I decided to actually have opposite grains because I think it's going to look better. But uh, being aware of that, I've got one dividing line down the middle where I glued them together. And over here, I got some knots, and they're going to present a challenge. So the travisher will work with the grain, and it leaves a beautiful polished finish which uh, we kind of have over here. Um, it also works very well across the grain. And uh, I'm just going to work at it for a few minutes. Um, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to create a ridge along this back line here. I'm going to leave that high, but eventually take it down probably another quarter inch at least. And then I'm going to have a bevel, bevel along the back edge here and then a little bit of a bevel along the front edge there so this is the front uh, I'm sorry this is the front here um, so there's a few different angles and shapes things you couldn't really achieve with a machine but basically you're, you're working with something like this you see something a curve or a line that you want go with it you know this is this is your own work so in this case I've got nice grain here that I can work with and, and just not even hard work. The way to hold this thing is the way I am now and most of the control is back here in the thumbs. 
um, because that, that controls the angle that the blade presents to it. And when you get one of these, which you can buy in a kit or you can buy some fleet. This was a kit that I ordered from a company called the Windsor Workshop um, in England. It wasn't that expensive. I want to keep a little ridge down the middle here. So I'm going to kind of make that a dividing point. And you can see that in fairly short order, Ah, so now I've hit some really wavy grain here and some really good cross grain. So now we're going to go to the other forte of the tradition, which is to go cross grain. And it leaves a rough finish, but we're not looking for a finish finish yet. We're looking for to get, get we're shaping, we're not finishing. So I'm going to stand on my bench because it's moving a little bit, but... Okay, so you can see it takes off a, you know, you put on a, put on some music and watch it for a little while. We're going to go back to here to take out some of that. You just have to play around, see what works, and remember where you're aiming for. You can also work it towards, this cross grain is fun. Also messy. So I had this all set up yesterday so it wouldn't work. An ordinary grain, it's really The nice thing about doing, making a seat like this is you can, the way I try this seat out is I stick my bum on it. If it's comfortable, it's comfortable. Now, something like this grain here, I might actually use a different tool like a, you know, a, a gouge or a, a spoke shave with that, but we'll continue to work with this for the moment. When you get on a roll, just roll with it. So if, if something feels nice and it's working, keep doing it until it doesn't. Change the angles. Especially with this cross grain. See, that works a little better from that direction. So if I weren't doing this on TV, as it were, 
I'd probably come over and work it on the other side. And that's exactly what I am going to do. And keep Lewis going around in circles. Eventually, he's going to fall over because he's dizzy. Now I'm working it out of diagonal. And that's beginning to get some of those really nice shiny but so I'm working the, the part where your, if you like, your butt cheeks are going to sit. So I'm going to work that a little more. But uh, the reason I worked the front here was to bring it down to roughly where I want the seat to be. So that works better coming from this angle. The other thing is, as you work your way down to any piece of wood like this, you get grain changes and angle changes. So you've always got to be aware of that possibility for tear. And if it gets to the point like here, where obviously I'm now beginning to get tear out, I'll work up to that point for a little while and then come back from the other side. fingers up above any splinter points, remove them if you need to. What a tool, huh? Plus, you do a few of these each day, you can get rid of your gym membership. <laughs> little tool it is taking big old chunks of stuff out and it makes a big mess very quickly you end up crunching around all right so what am I going to do with this cross grain I'm going to take around the stuff around it a little bit more My, my one little bit of poplar here has almost disappeared. So hopefully by the time we get down, there won't be too much interference there. Whoa! And one advantage of this is because it's not too um, because it's not too uh, you know, it's not cutting a super thin Cut, so if you drop it, it's not such a, a difficult issue. You don't have to reset the whole thing. Back to the cross grain work, just to try and get near to these. As long as you start thinking about how it's going to be finished, 
as you work this down um, so that when you get close, you're looking at not doing cross grain and not having to make big wild cuts like this. You just start maybe using planes or spoke tape. And I'm going to try a couple of things here. This one I don't think is going to be much help, but I'm going to introduce it because it's a nice tool, a very traditional tool. This is a draw knife. Traditionally, you make a horse for it, specialized horse, and you pull it towards you. That's a lethal light knife. If it were in a tool that you could wield at somebody, it would be a very dangerous weapon. This is only dangerous if you, if you mess up. Um, the, uh, the key to it is that you're holding the tool with your hands, so it should never actually get near your body. But you just got to remember, keep, on to the, keep your hands on. You know, because you, won't, you know, you can always protect yourself. I've never cut myself on one of these, except while sharpening, by accidentally getting my thumb on it. Um, but they're really sharp. They're really, really good, and we will use it um, for actually taking the uh, the oak down a little bit. Um, but that won't be today. I'm going to just try it on. If we can go back to the close up on this here and. Nice thing about this is I can take the little chip out at a time. <clears throat> I'm not going to use this much because my bench is moving too much for me to feel really safe. But you see, little patience and that. And Lewis is standing in front of me. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to use it too much, but a little patience, and you can see we get, you know, that can be a nice finish. And then there's a wood body spoke shape. This is specifically good because it's low angle. This is a low angle blade, so you've got a flat blade here and a brass kind of guide in, in front of the mouth. And there's a little adjustability to it, but the key to this is that low angle blade. It's, a, I think, a 12 degree blade, so it really cuts across end grain very nicely. You hear that nice sound? And again, when you're using a spoke shave, you don't always have to get a super clean cut. How are we doing for time? Half past. I'm not going to do the whole thing because it's just... Now, this is interesting because... There's a change in the wood there. It's not just a knot, it's almost like a sub knot. So I've got to bring this area down. And once a slope shape gets back to regular grain wood, you just thin. A lot of your rounded edges. You can shape with the spoke shape. I'm going to switch this, move this around just a little bit to get, to get it out the edge because I want to demo. Yeah, that'll work. Now I just want to be out the edge where I can angle things over a little bit. All right, so now with the grain going that way and me cutting that way, that should, this should give me a really nice smooth finish. And you can use a regular metal shave as well. The low angle ones are really nice because they 
they give you this beautiful thing. But, remember what this is mostly about? So let's see what a travisher does with this. I'll move it around a little bit more. Love hold fast. That's just so easy. And then all you got to do is just add one more clamp, which you'll note has uh, plastic pads on it, so they can use it directly on the wood. All right. Let's see whether we can make a difference to this baby with a travisher. line I'm heading down towards is where I want to be. Okay, I'm running out of room there. But you can see the general idea. I want to point something out here. When you're on a curved edge like this, and you've got grain running nice, even straight grain running through here, this top edge is what I, I call a crown. And it, you've got to watch out because you've got to switch in, in grain direction there. So now if I want a little bevel on there, I want to go the other side of my crown. And then I'll probably want to try a, a slightly different angle there because if I approach this from the wrong angle, that's going to tear up, which, when I'm getting close, is important. I'm going to see if I can come at it from underneath. If you go cross grain on this, it's a lot easier. At the moment, you have already torn some out there, the moment you start. So you can use this for heavy duty work. Really light as well. So something like this, yes, it takes a little more time perhaps than using a machine. Now here, my line's actually gonna come down a little bit and I'm gonna bring it down to this level for the seat. I'm not gonna uh, bore you guys with watching me do this some more, but again, I'm cutting now down to where the thighs would be sitting on the edge of the seat. Keeping this ridge in the middle, I'll work that down. And what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to establish the shape that I want. See how far I am from the bottom. And then, uh, and then um, take the top off appropriately, maybe bring it down but I get the general shape of it, and then I'll start working on the fine tuning. And as I do the fine tuning, I can use simple tools like I had to hand before I started. So we use this, simple straight edge. One reason I keep a ridge, keep the high point here, two reasons actually. One is to, if necessary, put coals on them. And the other is that I can take a straight edge and run it across here at any one point. I'll, un I'll undo the clamps. So, there you go. Oh, I'm good. I thought I'd 10, 10 to 11. I thought, oh gosh. Okay, so, I don't know if you want to go too close up. Yeah, you're in. Oh, I am. Right. Oh, yes, so I am. So, I, I will take any straight edge, and again, because I'm hand making this and I'm making it to, to my shape, as it were, um, if, if, uh, if I'm a little off, it's not going to matter, but I will use, you can see already, oh, I'm, oh that's why I, I was discombobulated before. 
you can see I'm already beginning to get that, sheet, that seat shape. So I'm going to establish those curves first. This is something you do in carving as well, is above the level of where you're going to, you establish the curves, you make sure everything is exactly how you want it, and then you gently bring it down to where you want to be. Um, and it's a really great technique for, for um, getting, getting things done. I've already uh, taken the edges off of here, but I've got marking lines. You can see I've got the, uh, what they call the pommel marked out here, which is something I don't want to forget. I want that little separation there, it really helps in, in comfort. I don't know why, but something about the way it supports your thighs. Um, but the beauty of doing something like this is you can really custom make it for whoever you want to make it for. Um, this is just a sort of arbitrary line that I've put around the edge of the seat. That's where I want my initial seat, lowest point of the seat to be um, in terms of, of, of the where, where the cheeks go, as it were. So that's where I want my low point to be. I want to come up a little bit, up a little bit from here, and then go down to this shape here. So I've got a little ways to go, but what I have to preserve is a dip here and then a gentle bump over to here and then coming up to the edges as well. And again, how far, how steep your edges are is a matter of personal preference. Um, and uh, that's what the wood looks like when it's, I just put a couple of coats of shellac on there just to, to show why I uh, really wanted this particular couple of pieces of wood to work for me. So, um, any questions about the cross grain work? Um, I will talk another option for you. And he, he mentions that in this, is to use a gouge. And again, you can, you can use gouges to take out, you know, to smooth off. You just use the gouge, find where the, the thread works. I'm not gonna do this much because this is not very secure. If, if in doubt, go cross grain. I'm going to secure this down with at least a holder. So you use a, a variety of tools is, is helpful, but you don't have to have them all. And here's another one that I've, I actually talked about a lot in the very first session we ever did, or second session we ever did, card screen. So you've roughed it out. You've still got some bits where you've got maybe a little tear out. Um, and so on, but you don't really want to, I'm, I'm speaking from a personal point of view, I'm not talking about you as a person, but me, if, if I don't want to sand it, and I quite likely will end up sanding this, I can use a card scraper. This is again a, a basically it's just a little sheet of steel with a very, very small blade on the edge here and on, on the edge here, and uh, we create that blade ourselves if we just get them as a, as a standard scraper and these guys are like miniature planks. You see those tiny little shavings? Those are actually shavings. They're not just scrapings. And they that really can take out there was a rough little bit there. It's not going to give you super smooth, but once you scrape something like this, you can take 220 or 320 sandpaper. And again, when you're scraping, try different directions. It's coming out smoother when I work this way than that way. Find what, what works to get a cut and what works to give you a nice smooth finish. And this can also be nice on uh, on you know complex thread patterns, uh, not thread, but complex uh, grain patterns like that, but not so you know the this, this is a fairly mild steel, and it's a tiny tiny little edge that you have to keep renewing, but uh, it really it's a it's a huge tool in in uh, trying to avoid as much sanding as possible. The reason I said I'm going to sand this one probably is that this particular wood because of that cross grain. I don't know if you can see but I scraped it there. Do you see that piece peeling up there? That's actually peeling up because I'm running the, 
the scraper along it. That's that's going against the grain. And yesterday I pulled out on the underside, I pulled out a whole little groove. Do you see that coming up? And that will come up loose until it's done with. So with black acacia, this is one wood where I really think I'll end up sanding it. But you get a little bit of, of cross grain there, contrary grain. And uh, you can start pulling that up. If you're not very careful, you've got a groove in that. You've got to either fill that groove or, or take it down below. Um, so you've got a number of tools available to you as an option. And finally, of course, what's really nice with something like this, though, is to use blades to shape it, to get the, 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 the surface of the thing, and then just use sandpaper. Even start with 320 and work up to 400, something like that. The, the key, the reason I want to do this with, with black acacia is because this very fine grain with all these colors shows up just so much better um, if you've got it's just clear if you if you can avoid that thing of base of basically reducing scratch patterns to finer and finer scratch patterns when you use a blade on on wood like this you don't leave a scratch pattern you may leave some scratches but you don't leave something that's that's uh, really deep or whatever because you you've got a nice sharp blade doing it and then you can sand down after that but that's just going to come up beautifully i think you saw you saw what the bottom side is like so i'm not actually going to do it because time is running on and i've got one or two other little things i want to mention um this is the leg and basically what i'd like to do in a future episode probably uh, next one is to show you how to make this like that make it round and then I will show you, I'm going to have to at least go through the emotions here. So we're going to get the the leg round eventually i'm getting a phone call or well, somebody is no it's not Daddy. me no. that's very <laughs> oh okay great so um what we're going to do is we will eventually make it round first by turning it into an octagon um which we'll cover next week and we'll use a plane to do that and then uh, we'll turn it into a circle using uh, spoke shades and and uh, our friend the draw knife. But and then we're going to want to create. We're going to want to create the uh, tenon, a round tenon. And I don't use a totally traditional tool, oh, right? I don't use a, uh, We've got nice round tenons here. I don't use a totally traditional tool to do it, but I do use a tool that is capable of being used with a traditional tool. So this is a tenon cutter. It's made by Veritas. They're not especially cheap for, you know, for just cutting a few tenons. So if any of you decide to make this chair, um, this is available to you. What's the diameter of the tenon and or leg? Okay, the tenon, this tenon, Cutter is one inch. I chose to go one inch. I think the article states seven eighths, but I happen to have a one inch tenon cutter. So that was my primary reason for doing it. And um, with the oak, I want as much of the, or with any wood, I want as much of the wood in the seed as possible. So that's my, my primary uh, motivation for that, you know, the fact that I already have one. Um, but uh, I'll, you know, given the right uh, swap meet opportunities, I'd like to build up a full selection of them. Has a re easily resharpened wood blade, very tough, has designed a, a way that you can take this blade out and attach it here and sharpen it easily. Um, even a klutz like me can do it. Um, but it has a nice, very sharp beveled edge and is designed for use in 
a cordless drill or a non-cordless drill or even an, in a drill press if you should happen to be able to set it up. However, they also designed it to be used in one of our more traditional tools, the brace and bit. So this is the way that uh, holes were, were made in, in wood uh, before, before the advent of, of uh, all of our electric, electric devices. So the original cordless tool. Um, this, is, this is a cordless drill. Um, and actually the design is only 100 years old or a little older than that. Before that, they tended to have wooden handles. So you see those old ones advertised as collector ones. If they're that old, you probably want to be more of a collector than a user because the wood will be old and dry. Might not be, might be just fine, but this is made out of steel and it's made by, I, I got it at the swap meet for at the, at the old tool swap meet for a few bucks. Anyway, it holds braces and bits. And there are times when you could do the seat with a brace and bit and a couple of mirrors. Somebody was just talking about that before we started. Um, but uh, you, you um, can also, make the tenons using this. There is a, a traditional tenon cutter. But basically, once this is secure in here, I, it won't work today because I haven't actually used the draw knife to, to remove this, but basically I can get that lined up. It has, it's nice because if I get my piece of wood level, there's a level built into the, I'll show you guys. There's a level built into this. So that means that as long as you've got the eyeball for the for the straight line here, the up-down part, which is the most difficult, can be taken care of. So basically, you you shave down the end of the piece until uh, until you uh, until you've got enough for the shoulder to start cutting, which is not much because the, it's it's a nice big blade. There. And essentially, you just work your way in. And I'll do it. The other way, I'll turn the wood, and you can see I'm shaving away the wood. So, um, really nice little piece. You can control how long your tenon is by dropping a plug in the bottom there. Just you know, cut off a little piece of a tenon and drop a plug in there. And if you only want your tenon to be a half inch long, then you can make it just half inch long. But uh, we'll actually uh, show doing that at a future date, but it, it's really nice because if you've got a one inch hole and you've got a one inch cut here, uh, I will finally actually put my little already excellent stool together. So I guess if you know you're gonna have a more robust person, you can make a little wider tenon. Exactly, yes, you can make a wider tenon. Um, your choice of wood uh, is a factor. Realistically, the design of this this um, stool should take pretty much any weight. I mean, I'm, I won't reveal my weight, but it's over 100 pounds. <clears throat> and, um, and I do tend to sit down kind of heavy. You know, I'm heavy on my tools, I'm heavy on my equipment. Um, but what was I gonna say next? Oh, I was gonna put the stool together. <laughs> So these, as I say, are just simply practice. These are some old bits of poplar that when I first started woodworking, I went to Frost Hardwood and I bought a pallet of offcuts, most of which I threw away. But I did use them to making models and, and of things that I wanted to make when I was first starting. And I've been wanting something to do with these dowels for years. So, as you can see, if you done did it carefully, your angles are right. And this is why I'm gonna keep these just as a set of practice legs. It's actually a sitable on stool as it is. A little uncomfortable because of the bits sticking out, but this is how you put it together, is you, 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 you uh, do the seat, got to do some for this it would actually work just the way it is I think uh, it's low enough and the angle such that it would work just fine but uh, in order for it to be taller we need to put in some stretches here the original design has um, 
One has three stretches, two on the side and one on the front. I may add another one, I'm not sure. I'm tempted to also try his original design without, because he, he has other designs going that, uh, that are, um, uh, that, that, that have different angles. And he, he himself in the article encourages you to play around with angles. Beauty about the thing is you can make this, you know, I'm making this with a 30 inch long leg because that's how, what works for me. It's just at the right height for me to sort of rest when I'm working at the bench or just feeling tired. Um, but uh, you one could make them at any height that one wanted to, and it's a, a very strong, robust little stool if you make it out of the right material. Um, but uh, I, I, I like stools and chairs. They're kind of nice. So that, that ends that presentation. So do we have any other questions? Any accommodations we should make for wood movement? Like where would this particular cut move? If you worked it and it's rusting, Okay, so the seat is going to expand across the width of the of the grain here. So that's going to expand. These legs are not joined to each other, so they're not going to be put into any stretch. Well, they are actually going to be joined by the stretches, which will give it a little bit more rigidity. But there's enough flexibility in the construction that that little bit of expansion in and out, and each one of these is got each piece is, you know, they both kind of move a little bit. Because each, there's a little flexibility there, we can take account of it. What we will do though is when making these tenons, these, these guys, they're wedged. And we don't want to put the wedge on in line with our grain here because that will tend to split the wood. So we put it across the grain. So when you're doing that, and it's against the grain, you better be darn careful that you get that at exactly perpendicular, because otherwise it's going to stream at your eye for, for all the time you own it. But, um, but you know, you could make this out of a piece of eight-quarter cherry, um, and compared to the making of something like, a, like another piece I'm making that I've been making for months, a little... little uh, table with, with, with floating drawers underneath, um, this is something that goes together really quickly. And uh, you could customize the height, you can customize the weight, you could make a hole in it if you wanted to, to, to you know, for your hand to, to, uh, to grab it. Or you can take it to the extreme and make a Windsor chair, you know, which is uh, the guy that sells that, the kit for that travisher I was just using. Uh, what he, he, he actually teaches how to make Windsor chairs in England. But uh, yeah, so that's the wood expansion issues. Make it, you know, obviously you don't want any any um, grains that are counteracting. I wouldn't care to do this with a di you know, with diagonal laminations. Maybe with a lamination, um, you know, where it's with all in the same line of grain. But, uh, but uh, no, I don't think there's too much expansion to consider. Cool, thanks. All right. And no other questions? Um, we're at 5 to 11. Um, uh, I'm just debating whether to just do one small, one more small thing. Okay, I'm going to show this off. So when you guys, uh, when we started this, this whole thing, I used one of the shop planes, a number 62, a low angle plane that, that I've been uh, wanting to get one ever since I, I i started using it and just fell in love with the plane and uh when uh dan won won that 62 the other night you know i've been holding out to win one for several years really but you know um i decided that that no time was time was uh right to get one so i i ordered one from lee nielsen and by sheer good fortune they had just got a batch of them made so I've ordered this new, and I just wanted to demonstrate. I'm going to have to clamp something down. So this plane comes, for those of you who haven't seen me talk about this before, it's a, can we go to the close-up? Okay, so you see the way that blade is real, real close to the um, 
to the to the adjustable foot. This is an adjustable foot, which means that you can get super super fine shavings um, because the, you don't you with you, you only a very very small piece of shaving can go through next to the blade, so you can barely even see through there. Um, so it has an adjustable foot. It comes. And not me there's only a couple of brands of tools that, that actually come ready to use. Lee Nielsen is one of them. These are machined dead flat. That, that's Lee Nielsen actually advertised that. And the, this is at a perfect 90 degrees. And uh, I did have, okay, I'm not going to waste time looking for a square, but I had a little square, little tiny square. This will do that. Thank you very much. If this were, oh, so that's perfectly square, which means that I can use it very nicely for, um, as a shooting um, plane. I'm going to make a little, make my own, what they call a torpedo. Um, well, they're no hot dog, they call it, don't they? I'm going to make my own little torpedo, wooden torpedo to attach here so that I can use it as a jointing plane. This, kind, this plane, if you are a new woodworker and you want to buy a high-quality plane that will last you for the rest of your life and you, you only want to buy one plane, this or the Veritas version of it would be a very, very good option. It's called a jack plane for good reason. They're, they're, they are a jack of all trades. Um, this, or this length is called a, a, a jack plane. This is actually called a number 62, and it's a low angle blade just like in the spoke shave shave there but by buying two or three blades you can cut those blades to different angles or even buy them at different angles and use this for many many purposes so if you go traveling and you you need just one plane or maybe two planes <laughs> um this this baby and uh, and a number and a number 60 and a half would do you really nicely so this this literally uh, came out of the box. I have done nothing to it. Most planes that I get, I spend a couple of hours working on them. Um, I, I, I won't do it, demo it. I also check the, 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 the bottom. I trust Lee Nielsen. I've got a blade sticking out the bottom, so I'm not going to stick this on the edge. But you put a straight edge on there and look for daylight. If there's no daylight, it's straight. If there's daylight, then you need to flatten out the bottom of the plane. And even some new planes will be like that. So um, this is a, a really good general purpose plane for a, for a, for a starting woodworker. Um, you don't have to spend the kind of money that you have to, that you spend to get one of these. Um, but uh, if you want to invest in something, um, then this is a good one. It's taken me years and years and years to actually get around to doing it. But I was uh, getting shavings in the region of a thousandth of an inch, and I have not sharpened this blade. It's it's sharp straight out of it. So let me just, uh, here we are. Can I do that here? No. So I'm just going to clamp one end of this. Putting enough force into it that, I, that, it's, that it's making the bench go. Look at that. Now that's a fairly thick cut. Whoa. Wrong button. But it doesn't take much to adjust it to a much thinner cut. Now that, that's a smoothing cut now. That will just take very, very thin shape. You know, this is white oak, which doesn't go terribly smooth anyway, but, but uh, it's pretty nice. And it's taking nice shavings. We could probably go up even a little bit thinner. No. So one, when you're, when you're trying to figure out where your blade should be on a, on a plane like this, one thing to do is to take a cut and as long as you've got a nice even cut like that, then your blade is straight. Otherwise, you need to adjust the blade. 
Um, so you take a cut, and if you get a thick cut like that, you back it up, take another cut. Back it up, take another cut. And then when you can't get a cut anymore, and as you're, as you're backing it up, see if you're getting a, a thicker cut on one side or the other. But once you've got to the point where you, you haven't got a cut anymore, then you start going back in. So little tiny bit. There's a little play in there, so little bit. I'm just catching some edge pieces there on both sides. A little bit more. You can see that it just took that tiny, tiny adjustment. And then, you see that's a very thin shaving coming out, but I'm using diagonal to get myself an even finer cut there. So there are all sorts of tricks you can, that's another way also to deal with um, contrary grain is to, is to turn your plane like that. But anyway, I just wanted to show that off. I'm so pleased to finally have one. Um, and I've already started using it. <laughs> um, but uh, probably this afternoon, I'm gonna take it home and uh, really polish up the back of the blade. But, you know, to, to just get something that will cut me I'm going to guess I do have a, a, a tester with me, but uh, I was cutting it in, a, in the region of a thousand the other night, and I think that's a little less coming out. So anyway, just thought I'd show that off. And that brings us to 11 o'clock, which is a record. I think I've got inside the hour for, for once. So any further questions or comments? Where did you get your travisher? Where did I get it? I, I now I'm later this week. There'll be a, a little a little uh, blurb pu um, published um, on the uh, on the website, but it's the WindsorWorkshop.com. The WindsorWorkshop.com. And if you uh, want to see the guy who designed this store's name, his name is Fabian F A B I A N Fisher F I S C H E R. Um, and uh, if you go to his personal website, you've got a lot of interesting stuff. And he's somebody who's been, uh, he's, he's been uh, woodworking for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, according to him. So not that long. Does that answer the question? Any others? Good presentation. Thank you for, uh, for being motivating. Oh, thank you for checking in. It's, it's all, it's, you know, the more the merrier. <laughs> what was the name of the plane? The plane? Yeah. This guy? What brand? It is. It is a the full name is a Lee Nielsen low angle jack plane. Number L N sixty two. And if you have cause to, to call the people at Lee Nielsen, you will you get treated like a human being who's really interested in their product. They don't act like they're selling widgets. They're really, really helpful. Um, the lady who answered the phone to me, we ended up talking about the challenges she has doing woodworking in an apartment. So um, that was kind of fun. Uh, but they're really, um, if you do order any of their products, it may be a little while before you get it. Just think because of the COVID-19 thing, they, uh, they've had to put a lot less people in the, in the machine shop than they usually do. So they've focused on the most popular um, and most demanded ones. But if you have to wait for one of their tools, don't worry, you're going to enjoy it for the rest of your life. <laughs> Is that it? Are there any other questions? So, um, for the future, I think um, we're going to do another sharpening session soon, and um, and I will probably, I may even combine showing you how to how to do this leg, because I think I can do that in a in a fairly short time, um, with uh, with a sharpening session as well. But uh, but uh, I'll uh, crystallize that in the next few days and and get it worked out, and um, and. By the way, if any of you guys are, and ladies, are interested in um, maybe uh, having a class to, to make this tool, do let me know. Um, and if, if not me, I'm sure we could work someone out who could, 
who could do it, but I'd love to teach a class how to do this um, or something similar. It's uh, it's one that's uh, it's got its challenges, but if you're helped through it and you don't have to stumble through it the way I did, I did, then uh, um, it could be a lot easier. All right. Well, thank you for checking in, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. And I uh, just one last thing. I want to say a huge thank you to Lewis. He has stepped in. Um, he's going to be helping out with our maintenance and uh, and uh, inventory and so on of our hand tools. And he stepped in as the uh, as the producer of this little program. And uh, we're very, very grateful for him. He's, he's, uh, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> what does he look like? So what does he look like, Paul? Let me step away and... Uh, yes, please. Step into... What do you... I'm sorry. Oh. What do you look like? Oh. Oh, would you step into the frame? <laughs> I look here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great. Good. Great job. Yeah. Lewis was in one of our intro classes, just, uh, just the very first one after COVID, uh, the, the first, you know, class from start to finish after the COVID thing started. So he was in just recently. And, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful product of Dallas, uh, making sure that our, our new members uh, want to do some volunteering as well as coming into the shop. So I, I signed up for Intro to Woodworking a week before COVID hit. So it was, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Anyway, so, so with that, we're very grateful to to have Lewis with us, and um, I'm sure before you know it, we'll have him in front of the camera as well. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.